tonight is going to be a great night for a lot of reasons. One of the reasons is the fact that uh, tonight ends at sunset, which has already happened or about to happen. Uh, Yom Kippur among the Jewish people tonight. Uh, of course, Israel has already, it's long time sunset in Israel, but Jews all around the world are celebrating Yom Kippur. We're going to talk a little bit tonight about what that means. Why is it significant? I mean with respect. Why is it actually right now in some ways not significant? It all depends on, on who you believe in and who you're trusting in. And that's, that's a question that we're going to talk about tonight uh, and, and some other things, some very, very awesome uh, current events God has provided for us for Amir and I to talk about tonight that are quite remarkable. And uh, this week in Israel, for that matter, for this week in the world, uh, there were some game-changing events that you'll hear about uh, tonight. So, wow, where do I begin? Um, Amir and I met, and the foundation of our friendship uh, began that day that we met. It was instant. It's one of those things that I'm sure you can talk about where you, you met someone, and it was, the, it was immediate, and there was just that, we would say as believers, koinonia, where the Spirit had knit us together. That's been some 21 years ago, and it's, it's not just been a long 29 years, it has been an intimate 29 years of great fellowship, of great ministry, great battles and challenges, great uh, things that Amir and I were team, had teamed up together to fight for the Word of God or for the defense of Israel and so this relationship has led to many trips to Israel, 18, I think, trips for me to Israel, and this church outreaches to Israel. We have a, a dear uh, soft spot in our heart, uh, because when I met Amir, he was in the IDF, and from that time on, this church has always been involved in support of the Israeli Defense Force, specifically the Israeli Air Force, where we help administer to the families there as well. In recent years, uh, God has, as you all know, God has catapulted Amir and has blessed him as he defends Israel from a biblical uh, worldview perspective, of course. Uh, Amir, if you do not know who our special guest is tonight on Happening Now, uh, Amir was uh, the last governor. The first governor of Jericho was Joshua in your Bible, and the last governor of uh, Jericho was Amir. Serfate, as he handed over with the United Nations, he was tasked to hand over the jurisdiction uh, of Jericho at that time under Israeli control uh, in the West Bank, uh, a mayor under UN resolution uh, handed uh, the documentation and the jurisdiction of uh, Jericho over to Yasser Arafat on the other side of the table. Um, God saved Amir, brought Amir into the family of God, and he has been a longtime friend of not only uh, Calvary Chapel, but specifically this church. He went to Calvary Chapel Bible College, School of Ministry, I should say, back uh, in those days early on. He lived in Chino Hills. A lot of people forget that. Our connection is extremely close. And Amir and I today, we were, uh, something hit me today when I went to go pick him up, and it dawned on me. I remember talking with Dr. Tim LaHaye and getting to know him and then uh, Dr. John Wolverd and Dr. Ed Heinsen and all of these amazing men of God and Dr. Dobson as well and wondering, oh my goodness, wow, they all knew each other when they were young guys and now 30, 40 years later, they've, they're still in ministry. And, uh, and then I turned to Amir today when I picked him up and I told him that and I said, you know what, now it's us. Now it's us. We knew each other when... when you know, we, your name, I knew your name, you, my, you knew my name, but nobody else knew our names. And now God is blessed and we are now like, like those guys. And it's like, oh my gosh. And we both looked at each other and looked like we had just, you know, one, you know, like a little toy or something at a store. It was like, oh my God, what do you do about that? Just amazing grace. And yet, listen, it's because of the word of God being exalted, honoring the word of God. And so um, we are just delighted to be alive at a time like this. Uh, this is an amazing moment in human history. We are so delighted that Amir's first book, this doesn't happen. 
Amir's first book entitled Last Hour or The Last Hour has been released, I think, just over a month. And it is now number one best-selling on Amazon in the Christian category in the world. In the world. So I told him to remember us little people as he's already been asked to author yet another book in light of the success. He's the founder and president of Behold Israel. And um, he's, uh, he's the most sought after uh, Israeli believer on, on uh, prophecy, on intelligence regarding military and all to the Christian community in the world today. He's a best friend of mine, and I'm so grateful. Next week, we'll be together ministering at Jan Markell's conference in Minneapolis, the, the nation's largest prophecy conference. We'll be together, and uh, it's going to be a great time. Church family, friends, visitors, give a great welcome to Major Amir Serfati. There it is. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Isn't that great? Yeah, my head is so big. His head's so I, big. I couldn't go under the camera. My head is so His big. His head's right got now. so big. Oh my goodness. Oh boy. Okay, let's pray, yeah? Together. Father, I just thank you, Lord. I thank you for my brother. I thank you, Father, for his precious family that's back home, Lord, and um, how they support and love on him. We pray that you'd just bless Miriam and the kids. We pray that you'd keep Ariel safe, Lord, as he's winding up his, his uh, first, um, really, career, though an as, Israeli uh, a citizen is always a soldier. But, Father, as, as he's winding down, Lord, his commitment over these last several years, keep Ariel safe. And Father, as Amir and Miriam's daughter, Lord Mayan, is getting ready to go into the military, we thank you, Lord, that every citizen there is a soldier for the defense of the borders of Israel and for the defense of your people. And Lord, I pray that you bless our time tonight, Father God. And Lord, we just thank you for this crazy, radical, wonderful opportunity to be, Lord, not only ministering to those that are here right now, but Father, to those by the tens of thousands, uh, if not more, that are tuning in uh, globally right now. And Lord, just please keep Facebook from pulling this. Lord, they're being real stinkers, and they think they own it. Lord, you own Facebook. Uh, you own YouTube. You own the airwaves. And we pray, Lord, for the preservation of your truth on these uh, vehicles and these mediums of social media. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Well, tonight, you guys, we are going to uh, get going this evening, and one of the first things that we're going to do, we can sit down, we can stand if you want, but... Um, you guys, we're going to talk about the significance, the, si the, signif the significance of tonight, of today, of today, and um, today being Yom Kippur. So Amir and I have been having fun. We've been driving around, drinking coffee, talking nothing, about, nothing but Bible. It's been so fun, which is kind of normal for us, isn't it? We're so blessed that way. And so tell the people... Some may not even know what Yom Kippur is all about. What's going on? Yom Kippur is the second of the three last holidays on the Jewish calendar. Uh, the calendar, as specified in Leviticus chapter 23, there are seven festivals that the Lord told Israel to celebrate. And the celebration of those festivals marked uh, the story of God with the nation of Israel, not with uh, scattered tribes or a specific uh, uh, people from our forefathers. As the nation began its first steps as a nation, that was the exodus from Egypt, that was the beginning of what God wanted us to remember forever. Now, it's very interesting because in Colossians we know that those festivals are just a shadow of things to come. And of course, the shadow is Christ. That We have Yom Kippur as the most solemn and holy day on the Hebrew calendar. It is, uh, if you come to Israel on Yom Kippur, you think that the rapture took place. I mean, literally, the streets are empty. There are no cars there. You can take your sleeping bag and sleep on the main road, and the only car that might hit you is an ambulance anyway. <laughs> so, but my point is, 
it's a, it's a holiday where the Jewish people are fasting 25 hours. They, act, they give one extra hour just in case they're wrong. And <laughs> just, well, well, you know, brownie points up there. And, <laughs> and then, of course, this is the end of a 10 days period from Rosh Hashanah, the, the Feast of Trumpets, all the way to Yom Kippur, where we uh, gather at the Wailing Wall and other places, we ask forgiveness and forgiveness of forgiveness. And then the culmination is Yom Kippur, where you give the last effort of not eating, so your name will be written in the book of life. That's the idea. And um, of course, at the end of Yom Kippur, everybody is uh, hungry and happy. Um, <laughs> But it's, uh, we're going to talk more about the holiday, but what comes after Yom Kippur, days after, is, of course, the Feast of Tabernacles. So I think it's, you know, it's very symbolic to, to hear the trumpet, to repent, and then the Lord is going to tabernacle with you forever. So we, we, uh, we understand that all the holidays were fulfilled in Christ for Israel, on the day on the calendar. And I believe that the second coming of Jesus, of course, will be fulfilled on the day of Feast of Trumpets. And then, of course, Israel will repent and mourn. Let's, and let's unpack this, what you just said. So, to the Jew, for the Jew, God has always been faithful to fulfill the feast which land on a certain day Right? Very specifically. Correct. Right? So, Yom Kippur is this time. You say that you're fasting, not you, but the, the Jews, Jewish people around the world, they're fasting for, for forgiveness. They're fasting. So, I fast, I get forgiven? Yes. That's, they, how, I get, that's yes. how I get forgiven, is I fast? They believe that fasting after you've already asked forgiveness for that many days, fasting is the last and the most significant um, sacrifice that you, you give in order for God to um, forgive you. So where's that in the Bible? It's not. That's the thing. <laughs> That's the thing. We, we, a lot of things that the Jewish people are doing today as, as, as well as in the time of Jesus were traditional and not necessarily biblical. Sometimes tradition is nice and beautiful, but sometimes tradition can blind you from seeing what God really wants. So do you, do you hear that, people? And this is a good lesson for all of us, is um, so the Jewish people, because they've, they've rejected Jesus as Messiah, they're still going through works of righteousness to achieve atonement for their sins. So if they fast to get atonement for their sins, then who is the one that's earning the salvation? Is it, is it God that's earning the salvation for the Jew? Or today, is it the Jew earning the salvation for himself? Exactly. So as we see, normally whenever people um, think that afflicting their body can give them any points in, in, in any heaven or whatever deity they believe in, it's normally the opposite. I mean, normally it, it, what they do, they, they self-glorify and they, they, they believe that the physical affliction will elevate their spirit and cleanse it and brings it to the right place. And that's, that God is not in the business of New Age uh, cultures and all of these things. The, to torture your soul is not to torture your body. And when the Lord said in Leviticus 23, from 26 and on, that, that you should do two things. First, you should afflict your soul and then bring me a sacrifice. And... Um, that's key. It is a key. It is a key. So the afflict the souls, I believe, is not to afflict your tummy. It's not to, to, to be hungry. That's not the soul. That's your body. I believe that in the Bible, whenever the Bible wanted to mention a fast or fasting, it mentions that. There's a word for that in Hebrew, tzom. There's a word for that in English, fasting. And neither in Hebrew nor in English... It is in Leviticus 23 in the verses that are talking about Yom Kippur. So obviously, that's not it. But what is it to afflict your soul? To afflict the soul. I believe, I believe personally that to afflict your soul is to come to the understanding that within your own power, you will never, ever be able to save yourself. Within your own efforts, you cannot establish any righteousness. That's what Paul said. 
regarding the Jewish people in the book of Romans, it says, um, I tell you, they have zeal, uh, but um, they don't have knowledge, mm. trying to establish their own righteousness. And so, when, and the funny thing of all, it says, afflict your souls, and the blessing we give to each other on Yom Kippur <laughs> is, may you have an easy fast. <laughs> so I'm saying, wow, that's a, that's a great affliction. Um, but everything, if, if you really dig deep into that, everything is smelling tradition. Mm. But one day, one day, they will understand what mm -hmm. affliction that leads towards repentance, that will lead towards salvation is all yes. about. And I believe that those three holidays will be fulfilled on the day of the calendar yeah. for Israel. And it's not, the Feast of, of Trumpets is not the day that the yeah. church is over. In fact, listen, friends, um, you know that this whole happening now uh, vision came about because of bad doctrine in Bible prophecy. That's why we launched this, if you were with us from the beginning, to unpack the things that are being said in the world in light of the Bible, not what people feel. Why do I say that? Because it's very vital that you understand what Amir is saying about this Yom Kippur season and the atonement of all these sins of yours um, in light of uh, the Lord and the Lord's return. Having said that, so people go around today, they write books, and they say, 88 reasons why Jesus is going to come back on such and such a day. You guys know what I'm talking about. Books like this. How I can tell you how Jesus is going to come back on what day? And of course, they write the books, they make millions of bucks, and then the day, the day comes and goes, the guy was a, sh a shyster, a false prophet. So what happens is people push back from Bible prophecy. You Christians are nuts. No, listen, there's, there's nuts in the mix, but, the, but Christian doctrine is not, is not nuts. God's very clear. The Bible says no man, no man knows the day or the hour regarding the rapture of the church. That's not true regarding the second coming. Note the difference. The rapture is an event that will take place at least seven years before the tribulation, or I should say seven years before the second coming. The rapture is the church being caught up into the air, 1 Thessalonians 4, John, 5, John 14. 14. But the second coming is like the first coming. The first coming was when Jesus arrived at the temple and declared himself to be who he was in actuality and overturned, you know, the, the Passion Week. When he wrote in as a, uh, with Zechariah 9.9 on the back of a donkey. First coming. Second coming. Christ comes riding on another horse or animal and to yeah. the city of Jerusalem. Second coming is very Jewish, although it encompasses the world. For people to say, oh, I can tell you the date of the rapture. Impossible. But, believe it or not, you read Daniel chapter 12... And for those who see the revelation of the Antichrist, the Bible tells you in Revelation chapter 12, start counting the days. Exactly. And you're going to know when the second coming is. That's why the book, the scriptures tell us in the Old Testament, on the first day they will cry out to me, on the second day they will cry, and on the third day I will visit them with salvation. Mm -hmm. Amir, talk to that, would you? Yeah, I just, I believe that it's important that we make the separation between God's plan for the church and God's plan for Israel and not mix the two. Because the church's departure is essential for us in order to be separated and have the marriage supper of the Lamb. We've got a wedding to go to. And we happen to be the bride, by the way. So we better be there. Uh, there be no wedding yeah, but, but my point is this. We, we, we have to understand God is not done and through with Israel. So... You know, he, he says in Romans chapter 11, Paul says that all Israel is going to be saved. So if Jesus is the only way, only truth, only life, and then Israel is going to be saved, that means Israel will accept him as their Messiah. And that is, of course, where Zechariah 12 says, and they look at me with whom they pierce and they will mourn and cry and they will um, repent. This repentance process, of course, is I believe the atonement that they will receive because of their affliction 
of their soul. I don't believe that the Lord, when the Lord will come back on the second time, they're going to fast. I believe once He's coming, it's not all about food. They will be so tired of, of the tribulation, so bruised, and so uh, hoping that it's all going to come to an end. And when they will see Him, food is not going to be the issue here. It's going to be okay. Um, you know, Baruch Haba B'Shem Adonai. Blessed is He who comes in the name of the Lord. So we are we're going to see that happening um, on the day of the calendar. And, you know, why would God fulfill all the holidays and only one He will decide, okay, I'm not going to do that. All the holidays will be fulfilled. It's just that for us, we have a wedding to go to and we don't know the hour so we can be ready at all time. And we must understand that. There is a value in being ready. The value is that we live holy life and we um, are expecting His return with joy and with, uh, with much uh, um, I would say encouragement. And Paul, every time he, he talked about that, he said, therefore, encourage one another with these words. And as, as, as the writer to the Hebrews says, for he who promised is faithful. So we, we, we can count on that one. So Israel is going to go through a terrible time. And that Kippur, that Yom Kippur of Jesus's second coming and the recognition of Israel of their sinful nature and their need for that Savior. It's going to be a real atonement, a real affliction of their souls. Mm -hmm. And because they will believe in Him, He will tabernacle with them. So you cannot celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles unless you went first through the Yom Kippur. And you cannot have Yom Kippur unless you saw him in his second coming, and that's the Feast of Trumpets. Mm -hmm. So you see everything is going to take place right on the right time. The only people in the world that know all of that are us. And, and, and we have the information that every intelligence service and community wish they had. We know exactly what war is going to happen, who is going to attack, when, where, how long it's going to take, who's going to win. Yeah. <laughs> we know everything. Now, if I go now to the prime minister's office and say, hey, by the way, Russia is going to attack, and, and don't even try to get other countries to help you because God is not interested in it, they're going to put a straitjacket on me. <laughs> but here we are, we know. Now, everything we know is happening, and I guess that might lead us at some point this mm -hmm. evening mm -hmm. to current events, mm -hmm. because we are in an amazing way watching those things happening in order for us to be excited about our role in this whole plan of God, which is soon to be out of here. Let's do it. Let's talk, let's talk, let's talk about it. Um, So right now, there's a big game changer with what's happened this week Correct. regarding Israel, Russia, and um, we talked about it today a little bit. Tell them what's going on if they don't know and how important this is for Russia. Yes. Well, first of all, Israel skillfully managed to have great, great, great friendship with both America and Russia, which is very hard. I mean, I don't think any country can, can get the two. Um, and also great friendship with China and India, great friendship with parts of Eastern Europe, Africa, and other places. So Israel is trying to somehow um, play it safe on all, on all parts. However, um, we realize that there are some things that we cannot overlook. One of them is for our enemies to have weapon that is precise and lethal. Most rockets are a big piece of metal full of explosive, but for the most part, most of them are not that accurate. They fall in empty areas, open areas, and they don't cause that much damage. But when you take those very, very stupid pieces of metal and you put on them a device that makes them precise and lethal, 
then we need to worry about all of our, uh, you know, um, power stations, mm -hmm. our nuclear reactor. We need to worry about our major cities and hospitals, all of that. That's when a country cannot, and what we realize is that the Iranians are trying to both bring rockets and work on old dumb rockets to make them smart and lethal. And Israel decided to attack both. Um, three days before the, the attack that we we're talking about, Israel bombed the uh, um, international airport of um, Damascus, and we actually destroyed an Iranian 747 on the ground mm -hmm. uh, that was unloading uh, uh, rockets and pieces. It didn't have passengers yeah. on the plane. No, 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 don't worry about it. It had no, other no, things no, on the no. plane. No. No, and if, if they were, they now realize there are no 72 virgins waiting for them. <laughs> uh, bad surprise for them. But, um, but what, what, what happened later is that Israel established with Russia a mechanism where, we've, believe it or not, we've got a Russian, a Russian representative in the Israeli Ministry of Defense and an Israeli one on the Russian Ministry of Defense so we can call at least coordinate our actions in Syria. The Russians are not in love with the Iranians, and the Iranians are not in love with the Russians, and the Russians allow Israel to deal with the Iranians, as long as we promise them not to topple Assad. That's it. They want to keep him in power so they can do business and eventually get spoils of war. What happened is Israel decided there is a golden moment. Sometimes there is a moment that if it will not come back. Mm -hmm. Israel decided to launch a, an interesting attack, one from the air and another one from the ground simultaneously. Not from the ground, from the sea, actually. Yeah. And that would confuse everyone because there are NATO ships of France and, and America and Britain, and everybody thought they started shooting cruise missiles. And... Uh, well, none of them did. And Israel basically sent four F-16s um, and from the sea, and I'm not at liberty to tell you how we managed to get to where we launched the rockets and all of that, but we, we were there and they didn't even know that we were there. In fact, we're still there and they don't know that we are there. Now they know that they are there. Trust me, they don't know. I'm not going to jeopardize They're watching but, tonight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but the thing is this. What happened is that in the attempt of the Syrians to divert the Israeli rockets, they were using Russian uh, air defense system, the S-200, and they actually shot down a Russian reconnaissance plane loaded with 15 Russian crewmen on the Mediterranean. And now... Guess what? The Israeli action caused the Syrians to fire and to shoot down a Russian plane. Wait, wait, wait. Did you, did you hear that? Again, the Israeli action caused Listen. the Syrians to shoot a Russian plane. If you know your Old Testament. Yes. There you go. How many times have you read in the Old Testament when Israel's enemies are coming against Israel and yes. God sends confusion among the enemy camp? Yes. Don't miss this. Yes. This and, is and, Bible and stuff. It's, it's a double humiliation for the Russians because it's Russian ammunition that hit them. Their own rockets hit their own plane, and so nobody's going to buy rockets from them. No, anyway, so the point is this. Here we are having to deal with an incident of 15 dead soldiers on behalf of Russia, and we have to explain what we did in a very unprecedented manner. We released a statement that we attacked. We told them what we attacked, which is a, a, a factory that is basically taking dumb missiles and makes them smart, and they were about to be delivered to Hezbollah. And um, by the way, if you go to my Twitter account, you can find uh, the picture of before and after. It's, uh, it's a beautiful, flat parking lot right now. <laughs> the point is this. My, my point is this. Um, we never heard it before, ever since this whole conflict began. We never heard before Russian voices saying that they should strike Israel. Listen, we've been friends with the Russians. We did their dirty job in, in, in cleaning the Iranians away. But this is the first time the Russians understand that their, uh, the Israeli presence um, can actually uh, stand on their way. Now, beyond that, at the same time all of this is happening, something else happened in the White House. 
Your president was hosting the Polish president. And out there in front of the whole world, the Polish president said that he would like to build a big American military camp in Poland and name it Fort Trump. For real, this is for real. You guys, uh, you guys remember, you guys know how, how critical this is because under the previous administration, the polls, the polls were put out to dry. Uh, do you know that? The eastern former Soviet bloc was hung out to dry yes. by our previous president. That's why they were terrified because they lost all, all missile defense systems. They lost U.S. posturing in, in Eastern Europe, making them vulnerable to Russia again. Mm -hmm. And they were terrified. So now the Eastern Bloc is delighted. And Polish, the Poles, have so much more vested in a request like this to have a base Correct. constructed. Uh, and they're not joking about the and Fort they promise, Trump. And they promised to fund it also. Uh, tell them about, listen to this, tell, tell them about what uh, the Warsaw one, Pact. one of the statements were made recently about the Europe paying their way, about making, remember the defense stuff we were talking about today earlier? Yes. No, you don't. I don't. <laughs> I could tell. About NATO? President Trump was thanked by a member of the free world by, by saying, thank you for making the members pay their way for NATO. Oh. Yes. So say it. Go, you say it. it so the better Secretary General of NATO, who criticized Trump for b coming to NATO summit and, and rebuking everyone there, he just released a statement that he thanks President Trump because finally all the participants started paying. Because you know you were paying, right? You know that. Yeah. You were paying for NATO. And don't, don't try to look for that thank you on CNN because you won't find it there. Um, but I, I just want you to understand, imagine yourself, you're Vladimir Putin right now. You've been in the Syrian mud for the longest time. You have no spoils of war, no financial gain. You just pay and pay and pay. Your ruble is sinking. You're, you're hated by the Shiites, by the Sunnis, by everyone all around. In fact, the only friends he has are the Israelis at this point, by the way, just so you know that. That's why he volunteered to actually um, uh, patrol along the Israeli border, uh, but I do want you to understand that what happened with Israel right now, together what's going on in Eastern Europe, is something that hits the pride of Russia to the deepest places, and I am seeing a great shift in the way Russia is, is, is about to treat Israel. Less than three hours after the incident, the Russians started sending aircrafts to Syria. If we had 16, now they have 30. And now they are also advancing more forces to air bases in Iran. We detected a request of the Russian Ministry of Defense from the Iranian Ministry of Defense for fuel services and ground services for lots of their jets and their cargo planes. And they are advancing them step by step towards Syria in order one day, I believe, to come against Israel. By the way, when Ezekiel describes how Rosh is coming, how Gog is coming, he's coming as a cloud from, okay. from the air. It's going to be something very, very interesting. And I believe that there is the beginning of a buildup of massive air power. There were always hundreds, of, if not thousands of troops, now it's airplanes. And they're all massing in Syria and in Iran right now. And we are hearing words from, for example, the deputy uh, speaker of the Duma, the, the, mm -hmm. the, the, speak, the, uh, the uh, parliament there, mm -hmm. saying that Israel has to pay because Israel is a puppet of America. And if America is hurting Russia by sanctions or anything, then Israel should pay the price for it. So in a very interesting way, we're finding ourselves paying the price for something we never did. We never shot down the plane, as well as we never imposed sanctions on them. But they find us the way to get back on America and, and, and more than that. 
So this is very, very interesting. We're living in, in unbelievable, unprecedented times where it's no longer Russia is going to come. Russia patrols the border right now. When we, look, there. when we look at the border, we don't see Syrian soldiers. We see Russian soldiers. We see Russian flags. They're patrolling our border right now. And we no longer hear friendly words only coming from the Kremlin. We're actually hearing some, uh, some rumors of war. Rumors of war. Right now, it's rumors. But it's going to be very, very interesting. And I think that um, these are game-changing events. So game-changing in the sense that uh, in the geopolitical picture, Russia uh, has a pretext, you know? Pretext is... Uh, An excuse. You know, this airplane was shot down. We're, if you're Vladimir Putin, as you said a moment ago, I'm losing face everywhere. That, listen everybody, that's, that translates into economic disaster. The ruble is plummeting. So if you know anything about history, when your economy is plummeting and you're not doing good, then the next thing that happens is you have, you're on the verge of internal civil unrest. What do you do if you're a leader and you find your nation in that situation? Who said it? Start a war. Start a war. Forget about how you feel about war. It's war is brilliant to redeem or recover your economy. Ask Adolf Hitler. Well, the, you know, Hitler. That's how Hitler came to power in Germany. Germany was on the brink of destruction on the in, from inside, and he created a war to build uh, the, the economy and ultimately, of course, grandiose ideas to take over the world. Point is this: now Russia's got a pretext. Could this be, we don't know, could this be, for those of you who don't know what we're talking about, could this be the hook or the beginning of the hook getting set? The Bible says, Ezekiel 38, in the jaw yes. of Rosh, whose leader goes by the title, not name, title, Gog, G-O-G. Interesting name, yes. name. Hebrew meaning political military leader. Vladimir Putin wears the same hat for both. Yes. He is the overall Yes. Dictator. And to add to the hook that you just talked about, it's amazing, it's brilliant. Think about it. The Russians are signing a deal with the Germans, of all people, on a, on a, a gas pipe uh, all the way to Germany and to Western Europe that is costing $11 billion. Israel is offering Greece and Italy yep. and Cyprus an underground uh, pipe that will cost $7 billion. Last time I heard, seven is less than 11. And the thing is, America sent, just last Friday, its Under Secretary for Energy to attend a summit on energy with Israel. And he said, he pledged, America will help Israel developing the pipeline so we can bring gas to Europe. And guess who wanted that gas? All those countries that don't want to be under Putin's thumb. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting because what, what's interesting in this whole uh, picture is that um, um, John Bolton yep. openly said, after his visit to Israel, he went to the Ukraine, he said, Europe should buy gas from Israel. Mm -hmm. Of all places, he mentioned us. So think about it. The Russians are sitting there. They're saying, these guys cause a plane to be shot down. There are major, major competitors right now to our gas. They, they hurt us militarily, they hurt us financially, and they're the puppets of America. That's how they look at it. And if America is, is, is imposing sanction on us, how are we going to hit America by coming against Israel? The hook is, is there, it's deep, and it pulled them all the way to the Middle East. They're on the border with Israel, and they're already contemplating on a military move, not against anyone else, but Israel. Wow. That's as if I just read Ezekiel chapter 38. Yeah, please be familiar with Ezekiel 38 and Isaiah 17. Breaking news right now, um, Syria's Assad is blaming Israel over the downing of the Russian plane. Wow right now on the, on yes. the wire. Yeah, but um, he didn't tell you that uh, all of the soldiers, the Syrian soldiers, were arrested, uh, those who were firing. Responsible, yes. yes. Yeah. But see the, the shift. Israel's got to be blamed. Everyone, if you follow these things, Israel doesn't even have to be in the neighborhood, and they'll get blamed. 
Yeah. It's just the way it's always been. The plague breaks out in Europe. It's the Jews' fault. Yeah. It's always the Jews' fault. That's the we, way the We world... stole the clouds from Iran. There's no rain there. We stole the clouds. It hasn't, it hasn't been raining in Iran. It's not been raining in Lebanon. And Trump so... brought the hurricane. Yes. I mean, it's the same thing. I mean, thing. I know he's powerful, but I, I yeah. didn't know that much power. Unbelievable. Um, but but the, the thing is, right now, if I were Israel's enemy and the enemy of the West, I would try to do everything possible to keep everything status quo and calm. I would write it out. You know what I mean by that? I would wait out. It's obvious you do not do anything while Trump's president. Wait till he's gone. Are you with me? No matter who you are, you've got to understand, if you're an enemy of the West, he's made it very clear, and he backs it up. If you're going to attack Israel, just wait. Just wait, because Trump's not going to allow it. Now, I don't know what your view is of Donald Trump. Frankly, it's irrelevant. God put him into office. There's never been a president since maybe Truman that has stood for Israel. Not a one. Reagan was pretty good. Nixon did some great things to save Israel. But this has been monumental, what's been going on. On top of the fact, um, I was talking to somebody on Monday who's in and out of the UN. I'll just say that. He's in and out of the UN. And he was telling me that the magnitude of global hate, you got to remember, the globe, you have sovereign property in New York City if you're in the UN. You understand that? Poland, Russia, Israel, your location, it's sovereign property. There's nations there. Actual na you, so when you go down the hallway, for example, in, in the UN, you could actually visit 10 countries in a matter of five minutes. Those nations, there are nations there that have this, as, as was reported to me by a UN insider, an unbelievable le magnitude of hatred for the United States now with Trump in power because Israel. It's all because of Israel, they're saying. Israel. What? Israel what? Israel, I don't know if you've thought about this, and I encourage you to, uh, to read a book. It's called, uh, I think it's called Startup Nation, regarding Israel. Startup Nation, like a startup company, Startup Nation. Israel, if you haven't caught on, is the regional superpower there in the Middle East. Amen. Their economy, their technology, yep. right? Their ingenuity, their military. And their God. The, uh, <laughs> and the God... He, Amir mentioned uh, Germans buying Russian gas. That's not a good move. Nope. Because, listen, you don't want Russian gas. It's not very pure. No, no, I'm serious. It's not pure. They're petroleum. You don't want to buy Russian petroleum. First of all, it takes Russia a tremendous amount of money to get it because it's so deep and so hard to get that it costs the Russians so much money to get it up to the barrel and then the quality of it shipped, it's not, it's not any good. Versus, you can stick a straw in the sand of Saudi Arabia, for example, or various parts of the Middle East, high quality oil, easily extracted. And then by the grace of God, God comes along and gives somebody an idea in the U.S. to start doing fracking. Yeah. And now the United yeah. States is the number one oil producing nation on the planet. Correct. And this is remarkable. As of this year. Listen, this is amazing. God is blessing the United States because America has taken a stand for Israel. Yeah. Didn't God say anybody who blesses Israel is going to be blessed? Anybody who curses them is going to be cursed? You're watching this happen, but I personally, I don't want to, I don't want to you know, throw water in, on the parade, but um, I think thing, everything's going to change uh, in either, either two years. We've got two years or four years. Uh, two, sorry, oh, two six. years or six years left. Hmm. Think of it. Two, two more years Wait a minute, or six? I mean, why are you rushing to say six? What if the rapture took place? Listen. <laughs> listen. The moment this level of support for Israel ends in the next presidential election, it could be in two years. Look, Americans have not proven to be the brightest at the polls. It's a fact. We could, we could vote them out, get something else, and the whole political posture shifts regarding Israel. Overnight. Overnight. In a moment. Because let me, look, we know. In a moment's time, even the hours leading up to the conclusion of the election in 2016, 
global powers were repositioning when they determined Trump could win. Change this, move this over here, shut that down, do this, sell that, buy the other now before the, the new sheriff comes. To, this is happening all around the world. And if you doubt what I'm saying, check it out and take a look. But the, the number one winner in what's happened of late has been Israel. And believe it or not, there's some, there's some Muslim nations that are delighted about what's happening. Yes. One of them is Saudi Arabia. Maybe you can talk about that. Yeah, the Saudis um, are no longer ashamed to say that Israel is, is not the problem of the Middle East, it's the solution in the Middle yeah. East. They're actually visiting Israel openly. Uh, Saudis on Saudi TV are, are actually praising Israel's democracy. The Minister of Religious Affairs of Saudi Arabia actually said um, just about three weeks ago that um, we are pleased to see that the Israelis have allowed their Muslims to go to the Hajj in Mecca, whereas our neighbor, Qatar, didn't. So they're, they're, they're watching us, in a, they're looking at us in a completely different light right now. The Saudis, as of last week, decided to purchase from Israel the Iron Dome. Can That's you imagine? Amazing. We're selling them weapons, okay? Um, and we do that with the American guarantee that that weapon will never ever be sh uh, uh, used against us. But we also have our own ways of neutralizing that weapon. They don't need an, they don't need, they yeah. don't need an American. Well, need an American. Let's put it this way, on the GPS of the rockets, Israel is not there. But, but my, 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 my point is very clear. The Saudis from hating Israel's guts are actually using Israel to def Israel is defending, helping to defend Saudi Arabia from Iran because Iran is using the Houthi rebels in Yemen to attack. I don't know if you know that, but Saudi Arabia is under rockets attack daily. You don't know that. Rockets are flying into Saudi Arabia every single day and they use patriots, uh, uh, you know, what you guys make, but apparently if they turn to us, I guess they want something That's else. True. But let's not... Uh, but, um, but what I do want you to know is that biblically, as you all know, Ezekiel was very clear about mm -hmm. how Sheba and Dedan, Saudi Arabia, is actually going to criticize the invasion into Israel. It's not going to take part of it, but actually criticize it. So the, sh the, the, the whole shift of Saudi from number one sponsor of terrorists against Israel to being on our side right now, took place already, that's it. That move had been completed, and now, we're, listen, I, I don't know what else can we say to convince you that we are on the verge yeah. of the beginning of Ezekiel's war. Israel is safe, secure, and prosperous. We've never been more prosperous in our history. We are leading in innovation. We are leading in technology. We are re le leading in water. Do you know that we extract water from the air? I know, you sneeze, we oh, drink. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, um, we, um, Tell them, uh... 90% of our wastewater is being purified. You guys, in Israel, somebody in Israel invented this, I don't know what you call it. It's the, the drip irrigate? No. The what? The, the ring. It's a ring. Uh, Ronan was telling me about yes. this. That you plant a tree in the desert, and you put this ring that this guy invented around the base of the tree, and... You, that's, That's it. it. He extracts the, the, from the air. This thing, this ring of whatever it's made of, pulls water out of the air. The, the Israelis were discovering, of course, we already knew humidity, but the Israelis invented, what do we need a river for? If there's water in the air, let's just channel the water out of the air. No matter where you're at, you can turn a desert into an oasis. If you, so how do we do this? So they developed a technology. You put a ring around your tree, this particular ring, and it waters the tree forever from, yeah. from humidity in the air. The Israeli cow is the most productive cow in the world. Happy every, cows, happy cows come from every, Golan. Yeah. Every moo is computerized. <laughs> they complain, but they produce. That's, that's, uh, and then, I mean, we are, I mean, in cyber technology, in financial technology, in cyber security, I'm, I'm talking about everywhere. Israel has never been safer and most, more prosperous than today. Mm -hmm. And this is 
going to be a different war. The war of Ezekiel is a financial war. It's a war because of what we have, not of who we are. Whereas in the very beginning of our history, in the very beginning of our history as a state, they wanted to kill us because of who we are. Let's cut them off from being a nation that the name of Israel will remember no more. It's no longer about our name. It's about the spoils of war. They come to take, to steal. Okay, two things. Number, oh, yes, the spoils. Those of you who don't know, go to Ezekiel 38. It tells you why Russia with an Islamic coalition invades. It says because of what they have. Exactly. So, first thing, and that was the second thing in my mind. First thing is why would they why would they give up the enemy give up attacking Israel for who they are I'll tell you why because they haven't every time they've attacked the Jew for who he is they lose every single time the clearly historically if you study war the last country you want to attack on the planet historically is Israel, because you will lose. Listen, Saudi Arabia, Iran, Iraq, you name it, uh, any country, Turkey, you're going to lose. How do you know? Because look at history. Look at the empires of the world throughout human history. They're gone, ladies and gentlemen. Israel keeps standing. Israel still is. And here's what's amazing, is that Amir just said they're going to go after the next enemy invasion is going to be because of what Israel has. Is Israel and its wars, they should not have won no. one war. Mm -hmm. No, West Point tried to teach officers Israeli military um, strategy, and they decided we can't because it, nothing makes sense there. Uh, in fact, right now, every Yom Kippur, we just celebrate 45 years to our terrible war of Yom Kippur in 1973. Uh, um, and I just want you to know that um, the stories that always come every year when we remember is how much the soldiers on the ground did exactly the opposite of the central command's uh, uh, request, and that's why they, they were saved. In other words, strategy, it is not. Uh, it is miraculous things that happen, and they're still happening, by the way, up until today. Up until today, Rockets are falling always in open spaces. We have, and that's what makes them angry. They call it un, uh, disproportional reaction because how come you kill them and they don't kill you? I'm sorry, talk to him. That's, I mean, <laughs> it, it's true. They want the same number of casualties in order to justify Israeli response when it will never be so. It will never be so. So, um, as, as Jeremiah said, uh, only when the moon and the star and the, and the uh, sun will cease from existing, only then Israel will no longer stand as a nation before God. So if they really want to bring an end to Israel, they should aim their weapons towards the moon, the stars, and the sun. That's good. I know. I've been practicing. So what I like about what's happening also, and not only Bible prophecy, or maybe it is, is something that's very dear to you and I, is I love how God is exposing the false doctrine that's in the church regarding the church having taken the place of Israel. Oh, the church has replaced Israel. God's, uh, it's, it's the church now. Israel, we don't recognize the nation of Israel. Christ, Christians will say, Israel as it is today is an illegitimate nation. You know that's coming from Christians in the, in the, the, re, uh, the uh, replacement theology of let's put, let's put the church in where Israel was. This is insane. And yet God is continuing to bless and answer his word verbatim exactly as Bible prophecy says to the word. And yet they still say, no, Israel doesn't, it's not real. So Jesus, listen, Jesus is not a Jew. They say Jesus is a Palestinian. They, yes, the Sabil Conference, learn about it. Christ at the Checkpoint Conference in Bethlehem, learn about it. 
learn about some of the things that are being taught in some of America's biggest churches today. Some of the most popular churches in America today are selling Israel at wholesale. They've embraced the BDS movement, boycott, diversify, and sanction. This is an Islamic anti-Jewish attack on the economy of Israel. And there's famous Christian people um, that are promoting this. Household names. This is a very, very amazing time. You need to know the Bible. And don't, you don't have to make any words up because, you know, the Bible says this or that. No, but believe what the Bible says exactly this and that. Mm. And you don't make things up or else you're going to find yourself on the wrong side of history and perhaps the wrong side of forever. Because God says, don't add to my word and don't take away from my word. And I'm really grieved mm. about so-called Christian seminaries in America today are a disgrace, except for a few of them. Most of them are just really upsetting because you've got unbelieving professors. I talked to someone just on, mo- on Friday night at a Christian university that hires really good teachers, irrelevant, and knowing that they're non-Christians. They hire these great teachers with their great achievements, but they're non-believers to teach your kids at a Christian university. This is what's happening today. There's no replacement for the Bible. And those who do not believe the Bible wind up replacing, for example, God's truth with a lie, and they wind up replacing the existence of Israel with the church. And no wonder why their eschatology is so messed up and everything else. This is a very dangerous time, friends. There's no, no reason why you shouldn't be reading your Bible. And if you read your Bible, you will by no means be led astray. But I believe we're living in the days of great deception. Yes, yes. If you're not in the Word, listen, great friend, deception. you're going to get deceived. I, that's the biggest problem among Christians nowadays is, is, is illiteracy in the Bible. And that's why they're being taken by so many charlatans and, and the, the, the deceivers. Remember Romans 11.1, 1, I say then, has God cast away his people? Certainly not. For I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not cast away his people whom he foreknew. What do we do? We have a half an hour left. We, we never got to talk about trumpets. Hmm. Should we take Q&A or talk about, would you guys want to take questions and answers or learn the difference between the trumpet that is blown for the Jews versus the trumpet that is blown for the Gentiles. What? Let's... All right. Okay. So, um, sorry for all those who waited with questions. No, we'll try to get this done In a manner... before the sun comes up. Exactly. <laughs> so, what's the deal? So, the deal is this. Um, one, of the, one of the major, uh, I believe, deceptions around the world is that uh, the church will be raptured on the Feast of Trumpets because the last trumpet, we're all going to be out of here. And uh, we need to make it very, very clear. Every time God designated the holidays and then later on fulfilled them, it was for Israel, with Israel, in Israel. Make it very, very clear. And so the rapture of the church has a trumpet for sure because first Thess- first Corinthians chapter 15 says so and first Thessalonians chapter 4 says so mm-hmm. but it's the trumpet that is being heard in the heavenlies and not down on earth and that is why in a twinkling of an eye we're going to be out of here it's not like a ceremony it's not like Mary Poppins we're going to be uh, going up there Slow this is it. yeah we, we're going to be out of here in a twinkling of an eye we're going to change and that is at the last trumpet. There is a trumpeting involved here. This is, this is amazing how when God told the people of Israel, make two silver trumpets, and that is, of course, in Numbers mm-hmm. chapter 10, he told Moses, make two silver trumpets, and make sure to use them in every amazing occasion. Amazing occasion. And it's interesting because I was reading when Moses and the people of Israel were in Mount Sinai, there was a great sound of trumpet right there at that time. That was a monumental event. That was amazing. God revealed himself to the people on, and, and he, the fire came and burned part, part of the mountain. It said a trumpet blast. Trumpet blast. Yes. God told Moses to build how many trumpets? Two. Two. 
at, the, at Sinai, there was the sound of a trumpet, not trumpets. Yeah, yeah, but so that, 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 that's, that's the trumpet of God, it, it says. Not, yeah. But my point is this. Uh, he, made, he told him, make two silver trumpets. Mm -hmm. And I believe that, w why silver, why trumpets, and why two? Uh, first of all, trumpets are an instrument that God said it will to direct the attention of everyone. Two, why silver? Silver, I believe, is a material that is precious but not perfect. And why, uh, why two? Because I believe there's only two groups on planet Earth that God is going to use. They're not perfect, but they're precious. And God is going to use them to get the attention of the world that is about to do something. And I believe that only, the only two groups are Israel, as Isaiah 46 says, you are my witnesses. Mm -hmm. And the church, as in Acts chapter 1 and 2, where it's go and be one, my witnesses. I believe that only since 1948, Israel and the church coexist. Thus, the two trumpets are sounding their voice. And it's interesting because Jesus said in the middle of the sermon uh, of the Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24, he talked about the, his, of the future of Israel. Then he stopped and he said, look and learn this parable from the fig tree. He said, when it's becoming tender and budding, then you know that summer is near and the end is at the door. That's what he basically said. So what I'm trying to say, the, and that generation, by the way, that is going to live throughout the time of Israel's coming back to life, because Israel, according to the scriptures, is likened to be the fig tree. It is a parable, he said. He didn't really talk about a fig tree. He talked about someone that is represented by the fig tree. It's interesting to see that there is only one generation that is going to witness yeah. the coming yeah, back great. to life of that fig tree. And that generation, with all the respect, is all of us sitting right here. There is only one generation, and this generation, I believe, shall not pass away. And I truly believe, with all of my heart, by the way, people tell me, oh, the length of a generation is in 20, 30, 40. That's baloney. Generation, if you read Psalm 90, Moses talks about 70 or 80. Uh, if to, it's a lifespan of a person and a collective lifespan of a group of people that is at the same time alive when something happens. That's key. And I, I believe that Israel and the church is something that never happened in the, future, in, the, in the history. Before the church existed, Israel was there. When the church started its history, Israel was out of its country, not a nation anymore, away from everything. Only since 1948, mm -hmm. it's a nation back in the land, and the church is still there. And God in an amazing way, has been using the United States of America, A, to be the first country to recognize Israel as a state, and B, to be the first country to recognize Jerusalem as its capital. It is monumental. That's right. We are the generation that shall not pass away. And so, you know, two trumpets, symbolically, I believe, it's Israel and the church, of course, that we exist. And God is using whatever he's, he's doing right now to let the world know. And we're soon out of here at the last trumpet. But Israel, the non-believing Jews, will still stay here. Mm -hmm. They, unfortunately, will only hear the trumpet when Jesus comes back. The second the, coming. Exactly, the, the second coming. And that is the Feast of Trumpet that is going to be fulfilled That's on the right. day, followed by Yom Kippur and the, the tabernacles. That's, in, that's so important, friends. Listen, the feast, the feast of Yom Kippur will be completed. The Feast of Trumpets will be completed. It's going gonna, it's gonna to affect, it's going to be to the Jew. So don't try to set the dates with the trumpet and all this now for the church. Um, twice Amir said, at the last trumpet, the last trumpet. Christians make a big mistake because, again, you get your theology messed up. If you would just read the Bible, you'd be fine. But if you listen to denominations, for example, that have particular views that come out of their either amillennial view or postmillennial view, they approach the Bible 
with a presupposition. Are you with me? What you want to do, it's, you would be better off if you rowed a boat or, wa- or you were washed ashore on a deserted island somewhere in the Pacific and you found a Bible. And if you read that Bible and asked the Holy Spirit to give you light, you would have perfect understanding of the scriptures. When the Bible says the last trumpet, don't ever confuse that regarding the church with the last trumpet, as many do, of the trumpet judgments in the book of Revelation, which a lot of theologians do. And it comes out of a bad theological base that brings them to that conclusion. Thus, they place the church at the end of the tribulation period. You can't do that because the trumpet judgments, and there's seven of them, are all in relation to the world in in the defense of Israel being awakened during the tribulation period. Mm -hmm. It's not Gentile. It's 100% Jewish. That's why it has to be seven years. It's got to be seven years long. Because Daniel chapter 9 verses 24, 5, 6, and 7 tells you that God owes Israel, out of its entire lifespan of existence, God owes Israel 490 years of specific dealings with Israel. The last time God dealt with Israel in Daniel's 490-year prophecy was on the 483rd year that just so happens to have been the year that Jesus entered Jerusalem and was crucified later that week. There's been a 2,000-year pause regarding Israel. Now, as Amir pointed out a moment ago, this is the first time in human history that Israel and the church have existed at the same time. And soon it's time for the church to leave and fulfill scripture. Mm -hmm. That day's coming. Could be tonight, according to the Bible. He says it's at your door. It's not like that far. And and it's it's, it's important that we understand we have to be ready. We have to be ready because we are watching. Look, Hebrews um, Hebrews chapter 10 says, be ready. And, and, and we have to not forsake our assembly and all of that. And so much so, the more as you see the day approaching. Now, we are the only generation since the time of Jesus Christ that is not praying for it, hoping for it, but can see. You see with your very eyes a Jew of the tribe of Judah born in Jerusalem sitting right here, right now. This is to see. Not to hope for, to pray for, to maybe, could be, should be. You see, this is the generation that can see the day approaching. Amazing. Somebody give us one more topic. Shout it out. That's, that's exactly what we're talking Repeat it. About. Repeat the question. That's what... Oh. You, I repeat? Okay. So um, how can no one know the day and the hour, yet some people say that the rapture will take place on the Feast of Trumpets? That's because they mix mm-hmm. Not gonna happen. The, the return of Jesus for the church with the return of Jesus with the church. They mix the two because both of them will have trumpets. It's just that the only one that will stand the criteria of fulfillment of the Feast of Trumpet is the second one, the latter one. When we will come with him, we will see Israel's repentance and salvation, and we will reign with him for a thousand years. The Lord will tabernacle with his people. Mm -hmm. So it has to happen in this order. And so they mix the two. And why is it? Because they don't. Study the Bible. Look, there's so much deception or error that is being taught all around yeah. on the Antichrist identity, on the feasts, on Israel, on, on the, the Messiah himself. You know how many people, uh, tell us how many people really truly in America believe in, I, in the Bible as is. I will tell you, uh, but I don't want to forget something about what she asked. So... Yes, I'll remind you. George, George Barna just did a poll. I'm not sure if it's been published yet. It was actually commissioned uh, and paid for by David Barton because he had a question on some of his presentations regarding who, uh, how, how many believers are there in the... Ch- how many believers in America who claim to be Christians believe that the Bible is the inerrant, authoritative word of God? So 
out of this magnitude of people who say that they're Christians, it was crazy. It was something like, like 81% said they were Christians in America. Out of the 81%, uh, Barna just began to ask these questions, these deep probing questions about them, themselves, as in an interview. And it came down to 28% claimed that the Bible was the word of God. Okay. That's where George Barna went to work and dialed down his investigative reporting on the 28%. And he asked the 28% questions like, is Jesus God in the flesh? No. Is the Bible God's inerrant word? Is it, is it true? Everything in it, is it true? No. Um, is, G, is, is, uh, is Satan a, a actual uh, angelic personality? No, he's, uh, it's an illustration. Satan's an illustration. Miracles. Guess how many people wound up answering all the questions rightly that you as a Bible-believing, uh, what's the word is, uh, literalist futurist, Okay, it was 3.3%. That would mean 3.3% of those who claim to be Christians are in fact Christians in America. That is actually probably more biblically true about Jesus as broad as the way. And many are on that path, but few and narrow is the path that leads to And that explains life. the that bad ex theories and the, and the wrong theories. That explains theology. a lot. Really quick. You're getting back to your question. Please, everybody remember this. There's raptures throughout, I mean, there's trumpets throughout Scripture. Well, there aren't raptures throughout Scripture. Ask Philip. Yes, Philip exactly. Got, he was raptured. Ask but Elijah. Sideways, not upward. Yeah, he kind of, yes. anyway. But Elijah went up. Others, it doesn't matter. Here's the thing. Ra uh, trumpets. There's numerous trumpets in Scripture. There's numerous trumpets blown regarding the last day's things in the Bible. Very simple way is to remember all this is there is the trumpet that concerns the believer. You, I hope, you, that you're waiting for. It appears from Scripture. Nobody else will hear it but the believer. You'll be removed from this earth that it if it happens in your lifetime or while you're alive to meet the Lord in the air, the Bible says so. Those who have died in Jesus Christ, the Bible says, the earth will cast out the dead. That person will be resurrected in the Maisie right there. Boom. Can you imagine? Mm. Yeah. Forest lawn. Yeah. <laughs> the dead will rise first. The dead will rise first. You'll just, I'll be doing a funeral and it's like, and Lord, we lay Bill to rest. Oh my goodness. And then we go out right behind him. <laughs> um, so the believer is waiting for a trumpet. Listen, there's another trumpet at the end that means horror and terror and devastation to the world. So much so the Bible says they're going to shake their fist at him when he's coming. And the Bible says that when they see Christ coming with the host of heaven, read Revelation 19, it says it's the bride of Christ with him. That the people on earth who are anti-Christ will shake their fist and gnash on their teeth at the appearance of the coming of the Son of Man mm -hmm. in his glory. Yes. And the Bible says that they will turn toward him and fight against him from Megiddo, Armageddon. Mm -hmm. But Jesus returns and gathers the nations to Jerusalem for a 75-day, read Daniel chapter 12, 75 days of judgment. Jesus will sit on the throne before he commences his millennial kingdom. He's going to take the government and he's going to clean up the world. And the Bible says, and you know it very well, Matthew chapter 25 is the fulfillment of Daniel chapter 12. The Bible says Jesus will be there and he will separate the nations, the nations, like a shepherd separates sheep from the goats. He's not separating believers from non-believers. There's a criteria, isn't there? where Jesus says, his own mouth says, I'm going to divide the nations of the world when I arrive in Jerusalem and I'm going to take those who fail the test and they're going to be cast in the, the valley of Jehoshaphat. At the, at the bottom there, the Kidron Valley, they're going to be destroyed. Their bodies are going to be heaped together at the judgment of Christ. And here's the criteria. Amir will tell you, Jesus says, this is the standard by which I will judge those nations. 
Well, the, the, yeah, thank you. <laughs> so you've, you've got an Old Testament and a New Testament accounts that are parallel. You've got uh, mm -hmm. Joel chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, and you've got, of course, in Matthew 25. In Joel 3, it says that the Lord is going to bring all the nations of the world in those days, in those last days, and he will bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat, and he will enter into judgment with them on this account, what they did to his people Israel, the people and the land. My brethren. My, yes. And then Jesus, in his teaching in Matthew 25, talked about how the king will return. All will appear before him. And he will tell them, of course, you, you fed me when I was hungry. You, you gave me to drink when I was uh, thirsty. You took care of me when I was sick. And they said, when did we do that? He said, if you did that to the least of my brethren, it's as if you did that unto me. And so Jesus is basically, just as Joel said, is going to judge the nations of the world at, when he returns according to what they did to the nation of Israel. Think of it. Think of that. Yes, so you're okay here. Um, no, yeah, but, but th think. All the nations of the world, I mean, it's going to be, it's the first time we hear judgment according to nations, not according to individuals. It's not like a person stands before God, because when a person stands before God, it's about whether he believes in Christ or not. But a nation will be judged according to what it did to Israel. And I didn't write it. The Lord wrote it. If you have a problem, talk to him. It's awesome. It's unbelievable. And to think, see, this is the commencement of the kingdom. This is the politics of Jesus Christ. He's the king. And before he gets the awesome millennium, oh, read, read the latter chapters of Isaiah. He's going to, hmm. are, you, are you a tree hugger? If you're a tree hugger, you should love Jesus. You know why? He's, Isaiah says that when he comes back, he's going to cause the deserts to bloom. Exactly. Did you know that a needle on a cactus is an underdeveloped blossom of a flower? It's, the, it's DNA. Is a, it's, a, it's a flower. The needle is a flower. All of a sudden, the Mojave Desert is going to be the most beautiful place on earth, if you think about it. He's going to transform the deserts, and the desert springs will blossom. Mm. He will take the environment and he will take nature. Can you imagine? He's going to make it perfect. It's going to be Eden again in the world under his leadership. But before he does that, he's going to turn the nations, as Amir just said. Mm -hmm. and, the, and the criteria for judgment is, how did you treat my Jewish brothers? Yes. Jesus says, he didn't say, I'm going to judge you on how you treated the church. He says, I'm going to judge you on how you treated my brethren. Yes. Brethren is that good old Hebrew word as brothers. You will die and you will gather to your fathers or to your brothers, mm -hmm. to your family. Yes. Jesus is going to say, so how did you treat my nation? Can you imagine some of these nations? Well, it doesn't have to be the nation. You say, I don't care about a nation. Well, let me ask you, what about, your, what about the church you attend? What are, they doing to the, what are they doing for the nation of Israel today? What is your church doing to evangelize the Jewish people? Hmm. And remember, Israel, if Israel is tossed away, what does it say about God? It says that he's not a God that keeps his covenant. Israel is your insurance policy that God is going to take care of you as well. Mm -hmm. and, and God kept them, used them. They produced to the world the belief in one God, the word of God, and the son of God. And they went through so much persecution because of that. And eventually, they will be rewarded with salvation based only on their repentance and confession that they need that same Savior whom they pierced 2,000 years ago. And now they, tell, they say to him, Baruch haba b'shem Adonai. And it's beautiful because Jesus himself prophesied and said to Jerusalem, you look at me, Jerusalem, you're not going to see me again until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name yeah. of the Lord. So they will have to ask for him to come. And he will come, as always. I'm so sure that he'll keep his promises, that if he does not keep his promises to the Jews, I have no promises exactly. that he owes to me. Mm. You need to reconcile that right now. Yes. If God breaks his promise with the Jewish people, you have no, you have no guarantee of eternal life. It's over for you. It's over yes. for me. Amazing. Okay. And I always tell people, when Christ is coming back, you really don't want to see his face. 
you want to see his back. You want to ride behind ride him with rather him. than see him. Because he comes back as a man of yep. war. Listen, tonight, amen to that. Tonight, do you know Jesus Christ personally? This is not a mechanized system of belief. This is not a religious entity. Christianity and biblical Christianity is not a club. It's not a social club. I can't think of a greater opportunity in time for you tonight than now for you to say yes to Jesus. Hmm. The same prophets that have talked about the soon coming war with Russia, it's Islamic alliance against Israel. The, by, that, by the way, that Bible says that the invading armies will be completely destroyed by God yes. in the mountains of Israel. The same God that made that promise is the exact same God that said, you'll be able to recognize my son. He'll be born in the little town of Bethlehem. There'll be a scandal surrounding his birth. His mother will be uh, apparently accused of some misconduct because a virgin shall conceive and bear a son. Mm -hmm. And the Pharisees that attacked Jesus and said, we know who our father is. Who's your father? They called him a you-know-what in Israel. And yet everything about him was fulfilled in Scripture. Everything that is said about him yet to be fulfilled, my dear friend, will be fulfilled exactly as the Bible said. What has been done has been done literally. Hmm. What remains will be done, will be done literally. And I want to ask you tonight, Amira and I want to ask you tonight, have you literally given your heart to Christ? Have you given him your real existence? Not your lip service on Sunday, but a real, absolute heart hand Amen. over to him as Lord and Savior. We're not talking religion here. We're talking relationship with, you, with the living God. You need to do that. He died on the cross for your sins. Some people say, oh, I didn't need that. Uh, that's okay, I'm not that bad. Yeah, you, you are so bad. You're super bad if that's the way your attitude is. You're super bad because you can't even see it. Then there are some people who will say, well, you know what? I, I'm so bad, Jesus couldn't have paid for all my sins. Don't flatter yourself. His blood's greater than your sin. Amen. You need to ask him simply like this. You can say, Lord Jesus, come into my life. I believe the scriptures about who you are. I don't understand much, but I understand enough that what I'm hearing tonight is truth. And God, listen, I'm so serious. I believe he takes this for real. God, if you're real, will you show me who you are? Just show yourself to me. Mm. By whatever means you'll know that will convince me, God, reveal yourself to me. He will do that. Amen. The problem is you may not be intellectually honest with yourself enough to, to, to ask that question. You may not want to know the answer because you're enjoying your sin. Your sin will kill you. It's killing you now. But he loves you. He says, I love you. But he also says, his spirit will not always strive with you. He's not always going to put up with you. And so you need to make that decision. We pray that you make that decision. In your own heart, in your own mind now, you can tell him. I pray, we pray together tonight that if you do not, if, if you're serious about maybe considering Jesus and you have heard of these challenges tonight, it's our loving prayer for you that you would not be able to sleep, rest, have any comfort from this time forward until you lose in this struggle with God. Amen. Because he is mighty to save. Amen. Father, we thank you for your time, your truth, your promises to us. We thank you that we've not followed cunningly devised fables but the sure word of God, the word of prophecy that did not come to us by man or by the invention of man, by, but by holy men moved, touched by your Holy Spirit who authored these things. That all of these things that have been written down have been written down for our learning and for our comfort. And Jesus, that your promise stands sure tonight that whoever believes in me, though he may die, yet he shall live. For I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes to the Father but through me. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever would believe in him would not perish but have yes. everlasting life. Jesus said, unless a man is born from above, born again, he will not see the kingdom of heaven. So friend, tonight, 
in this room, there are either those who are born again, whose names are written down, and what an appropriate night to ask this question on Yom Kippur. Is your name written down in the Lamb's Book of Life? Is it written there? All those who know their name is written there are comforted by that fact. If you do not know that tonight, if you don't have the assurance of your salvation tonight, Thank you.